Sai Jacobs, you coming to the Biz News Conference at the end of the month, debating with Pete Fulhoun. Thank you, Alec. Very privileged to receive the invitation. So looking forward to it. I've heard about it. And uh, hopefully we'll have a good chat over a few days. How do you differ in your investment approach to Pit Fillions? Uh I don't want to talk on behalf of Pit, but you know, from what I understand, Pit is very much a value investor. I think at 361, we always started off almost as a flexible investor. So when we feel the tide is right and value is in favor, we're happy to be a value investor. When we think growth is right, we have to be a growth investor. And there are, in our mind, very obvious cycles in this market that are predictable. And if you look over the last few decades, it's been good for almost a decade to be a growth manager, then a value manager, then again a growth manager. So I think it's difficult to box yourself, particularly in South Africa, Mm. where there aren't that many opportunities. The market is small, liquidity is not there, and really your value bucket or your growth bucket is quite small. Aggregate them together. And in our case, obviously, we're also a hedge fund manager, so we, we can do both of those in the opposite direction as well. But I think that whole style of what we do is quite different. We're, we're maybe more short, medium-term focused, looking at the changing trends. Um, and, you know, we, we believe in value, but it's, you know, value at a price and depending on the right cycle. So just in case uh, you've never met Sai Jacobs before, he's one of South Africa's uh, most highly rated asset managers, co-founder of 361. When did you guys, uh, you and Stephen, start 361? We started in 2004. We'd been at Investec for five odd years before that, and before that at HSBC for a period of time. Myself, three, Steve, I think two years. But the end of 2004, so we're almost 18 years in the making uh, at 361. And you've built a big reputation, attracted a lot of money. How, how much do you have under management? We now? manage approximately 33 odd billion rand. Um, about 20 of that is in long only and flexible strategies and 13 odd in hedge funds. And you haven't really been beating your marketing drum, which I guess is something we like a lot. Uh, we like the, the, the fund managers who do well Uh, who keep their light under a bushel, who don't actually have to go out and market themselves. There is one thing, though, at 33 billion. I was looking at one of your unit trusts, which was sitting at at 5 billion at the moment. Is size an anchor on performance? Size is definitely an issue when it comes to performance. I think for us, size is not yet at that specific tilting point. So we're managing perfectly well. And we have created, I think, something different a few years ago uh, at 361, which has helped us, which is we have siloed the business into its various mandates. Specific investment committees focus on specific mandates. The whole team has input in the research process, but each and and every mandate is catered by itself Mm -hmm. individually. So it allows flexibility and different dealing times and different opportunities. And the mindset around every single mandate is different. So for example, if you're in a flexible mandate or a balanced mandate, your mind, your, your, your mind has to be about absolute return. It's not about beating a benchmark of the market. Therefore, you're only looking for opportunities of an, in an absolute nature, whether that be bonds or you know, cash or equities and only equities that can give you a positive return. When you're trying to manage money to beat cap SWIX or SWIX or whatever that index is, your focus is against that index. So it requires a different mindset and a different approach. And the two luckily often don't coincide in their opportunity set. So you're able to segregate your assets out quite nicely. And we've done that exceptionally well over the last few years and created these, call it superstars who manage the different buckets. And as a result, we have good capacity in each and every one of those. So, How, how do you hang on to those superstars? And I'm asking you this because uh, Jean-Pierre Fester has gone off to row his own boat. He was part of your team for a long time. Uh, how, how do you look, how do you keep them in the, in the yeah, fold? So, so, you know, we all are one team with a very flat structure. 
um, you know, when JP Fister left us and he was an exceptionally and is an exceptionally talented and smart individual, you know, he wanted to row his own boat. He wanted to manage his own fund and and do things he th the way he wanted to. You know, we're a team. We've got a team-based approach. Uh, we're all incentivized by the performance of the funds. So, you know, since he left at the end of 2015, we haven't lost any other people. In fact, we've gained some seriously good intellect, smart, young, fascinating people who've actually, you know, I think lifted 361 to, to its next level. How do you find them? It's, it's a very interesting uh, story, actually, on a couple of different people. But um, one actually came to me via Twitter. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to mention too much publicly, but, you know, he realized that, uh, you know, there were some opportunities we were looking at. And the, he messaged me privately via Twitter um, around those opportunities. And I could see this was someone who had enormous insight. And he was very young. Um, and we got to meet and uh, from there I could see you know this was the, someone who eats sleeps dreams the market understands the globe macro and macro so we found people like that we've got an, a number of them actually in the business uh, and they get to work with San Jacobs <laughs> I get to work with them I really think these days <laughs> no, that's, that's these humble, days, but, these days mm -hmm. to be to be honest yeah. they're a lot smarter they see a lot more things they have a lot more access to multimedia at a different level uh, to us. Um, they can search out of something much quicker. Um, and I think uh, yeah, to me, you know, thank God I'm still in the business and I love what I do every day, but I think it could, it could really operate without me. Quite frankly, it's, there's a very strong team beneath me. Who are your guiding lights? And I mean here, uh, Warren Buffett, Howard Marks, Ray Dalio, Phil Fisher, John Templeton. There are, there are lots of these icons. Is there any one of those or a combination of those that have guided your approach? I, I don't think anyone stands out, to be honest. Um, I like to read uh, a lot of what they have to say, look at a lot of the opportunities, follow a lot of good managers to see what they're buying and the timing of what they're buying and seeing how that works out. I think for for us though, there's no one person, you know. And, and as I said to you before, if I was a big value investor, you know, maybe Buffett would be that person. But there are many times where we feel, you know, growth is is the flavour, and rates are low, for example, and the Fed is driving growth, you know. Then you know that market doesn't outperform. So we're just trying to be flexible and pick which manager we like at which particular time. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned out there. Today, there is so much information, not only from what those managers are doing, but from various social media platforms, business platforms like yours, Twitter, which I find to be fascinating if you're following the right people. Uh, who do you follow? Uh, who are the right or, people? Who, who are the right <laughs> people? I think anybody out there is able to look at a Twitter account. It's open. Mm. You can see who I follow. Um, you know, besides all my interest in nature and other things, when you do find the business ones, uh, you'll see a very interesting uh, array of people, um, you know, and it, it could be the, you know, people who are anti various corporations in the US, people who understand legislation well, I follow people in China even who are very close to political people and commentate regularly. So I think there's a, I think if you can get that mix right of, those people, you can really stay at the forefront of what's happening in global markets. And that's, that's what we try and do. We run a couple of model portfolios really just to encourage our community to invest in equities directly. So the idea is have a look at the models, do your own homework and follow or not, primarily on the offshore side. I was delighted to see that uh, we recently added ABSA to one of them, that ABSA is like a big bet of yours and that you bought into it at pretty much the bottom. What was that story? So again, coming into COVID, realizing who would be the most affected, obviously not knowing how COVID would play out, but knowing that this train wreck was, was headed your way, our thinking was you know, that rates would be lower that tech would accelerate faster, that the likes of domestic banks and normal businesses would, would be in big trouble. So at that time, we had zero banks. And in fact, in the hedge funds, we were short. 
it turned out to be the perfect combination. And we decided- When you short? I mean, what short does that being, mean? I mean, we, we effectively were making money on the deterioration of the ABSA share price and other banks. So you sold the we shares sold without, shares owning, without them. owning them. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the, mm -hmm. the share prices uh, declining actually helped our profitability in our hedge funds. In our long only mandates where you're unable to short, we had no banks. Um, those fell dramatically. And obviously the poorer quality banks, which are perceived to be poorer quality, the Ned banks and the Absas fell far more than the likes of the first rands. Um, when we saw that, we eventually realized we were buying uh, Absa and Ned Bank actually at one stage, you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 times the value of their books. Explain that. Explain the NAV of the entire bank. In other words, if you had to look at all their assets and all their liabilities and assuming they even never even made future profits out of that, that asset pool and they managed to unwind everything and return everything to shareholders, you still would have made approximately two times your money. But these businesses were ongoing. They weren't going to falter. So, you so had you're that buying a, a, you buy a rand's worth of asset for 40 for, cents. For, for 40 cents, mm -hmm. correct. And you had the ability of this business to make profitability with their rand of assets, which is which the market wasn't realizing. So when we realized that COVID was not here to stay and the world was going to support uh, co businesses, uh, governments were going to support, we thought those businesses were in fact the cheapest businesses. So we went very overweight. The likes of Nedbank and APSA, those more than doubled um, in the period of COVID and have still carried on recovering. And in fact, I think today would be a lot higher if they wouldn't have come from such a, a low base because even in today's terms, ABSA, as you can see after results, is probably trading around a you know six multiple forward uh, with a very good dividend yield of probably close to eight. I'm guessing I haven't looked at exactly where it is in the last but few cheap. Years. But Still cheap. 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 So we weren't wrong right putting it in. You were right. <laughs> okay. so, but, but late, I mean, but <laughs> okay. it's, it's never too late. But it's interesting, you and Pete Fulion actually agree on ABSA, but you don't agree on NASPAS. And I, I saw that you got NASPAS in your portfolio. Now, NASPAS is, a, is an interesting story. Uh, it owns primarily uh, a, a stake in Tencent, which was bought more than 20 years ago. And it's now able to sell those shares in Tencent to buy back its own shares, which traded at a huge discount. When did you start buying into NASPAS? Okay, so first of all, as I said before, there are times to own shares and there are times not to own shares. So our view on NASPAS must only be taken as our current view on NASPAS, mm -hmm. which currently we're about market neutral on. That means that in our long only mandates, where for example, NASPAS and process combined are say 10% of the index, we round about 10%. That for us means we think it's going to perform roundabout in line with the market. In the hedge funds and the and the flexible funds and et cetera, we only have a little bit oh. of NASPAS and process because it has already re-rated phenomenally from the bottom once all those plans have been announced. But if you take us back for a number of weeks, we were overweight in the long onies, three, four percent overweight, and we had as much as seven percent just sitting in the absolute funds in the hedge funds. That's, That's now, interesting. Now, how did you get that so, one right? Because the rest of the market, the so, best share, just for and, people who don't understand, and not, went not down to, to brag, not to brag, went down to eighteen hundred rand. Not to brag, yeah. but coming into COVID, when I mm. mentioned earlier that we were underweight, the likes of the Absas and the Ned Banks, etc., mm. we were actually almost ten percent overweight, Naspers and Process, and that actually performed phenomenally well in a period of COVID. When we felt we were coming out of COVID, we went from massively overweight to underweight. So we actually hardly owned NASPAS on the whole way down from the four and a half thousand combined to two and a half thousand or wherever it got to. Got to 1800. It got to eight, no, 1800 as it's, I'm saying combined with the mm -hmm. process. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So the combined, the combined price actually never impacted our performance. We actually outperformed on the way up and we outperformed on the way down in our long onlys by having an overweight and then an underweight position. And in the hedge funds, we basically had no NASPAS on the way down. So we weren't impacted at all. So the important thing is what is our current view? Our current view is a large portion of that discount has now been eroded by the plans of NASPAS to sell approximately 3% of 10 cent every year which is 10% of their underlying holding. So it would take them approximately mm -hmm. 10 years at this rate 
to sell the holding. Um, but we feel that a large portion of that discount has already been eroded. So now really it's a call for us on how well Tencent will perform. And as you know, or what we feel, you know, China is in a big predicament at the moment, economy not the best, property doing poorly, and a lot of the legislation has prohibited uh, a lot of growth in the technology space. There's just been some new gaming approvals that came out the other day. Once again, Tencent was ignored or particularly or maybe selectively left out of the new gaming approvals. So that share price has been particularly weak. In the hedge funds, just to explain what we've done, we do have a little bit of NASPAS and process, but we are short Tencent. Uh -huh. So we have played the discount narrowing, and that discount has narrowed quite substantially. But that seems obvious. If you it's, think about it, you... Uh, absolutely. The one is overpriced relative to the yeah, other. Correct. And you can sell those to buy there if you nice pass. Yes, correct. So that 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 discount has has dissipated and as a result we've made money on that trade regardless of what happened. And that's what you do as a as a hedge fund. You that's look you for those hedge. opportunities. Absolutely. What got you into thinking along those lines? So uh, where was the where did that, that uh, light go on? The light really went on probably a few times in my past. Um, in the early 2000s, I followed a few global hedge fund managers um, and they'd been quite successful in identifying uh, frauds. You know, I'd read about uh, Enron, for example, and what happened there. Um, and I always particularly felt that there was a lot of, um, you know, there, there wasn't always truth in what many managers said in the South African market. And over time, I recognized that some of those managers were potentially even fraudulent. These are corporate executives you're talking corporate about. Corporate executives. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to be quite frank, when I, when I first met Marcus Eusta in 2009, after they took over JD Group, um, and I approached him at a JD Group results, and historically, I'd been the JD Group audit manager many years before that in my articles, and I knew that business exceptionally well. Um, and we were short, meaning we were looking for JD Group to disappoint on results because we'd seen the likes of Protea Furnishers hit the wall. This was headed the same way. We understood everything around that. And then I got there and the results were fantastic. They were off the charts. And I went that day in that meeting to Marcus Eurster in 2009 and said, these results are not correct. You've wow. done X, you've done Y, you've done Z. And I thought, my naivety said, maybe JD Group had got one over on Steinhoff. I soon realized once our invitation stopped coming to corporate events and I started looking through Steinhoff that the problem was in fact uh, much deeper than JD Group and uh, Steinhoff was in fact uh, the problem child. But we were alone, we were small, we had no voice uh, and that whole, that whole debacle took a further eight years to get exposed. Um, and we even, at the time, we, we just after that employed Evan Walker from RMB. RMB had a very strong relationship with Steinhoff. Like top retail analyst in South top Africa. Top retail yeah. and mm. retail analyst. He said, look, there could be, there couldn't be, but the market loves it. So Evan actually saved us quite a bit of money by not making it a particularly big short and at the time being even a bit long for times. and. He said, you know, you're fighting against a, a proper big flow of, of liquidity here. So we were right, and we were probably, we were way too early. Eventually, we had a small short in the end in the hedge funds, made a little bit of money back. But I think on the whole, it was a lost opportunity to us. But that's what got me interested. Those type of, those mm. type of, of people that uh, arrive in our investment universe and suddenly grow so big, so quickly, um, you need to look under the, the hood to understand. And do the same in, in property. Yeah. Do you that, study? Do you study psychology? Because uh, if you if you look I back at us, really. there are sociopaths. They are. They walk among us, absolutely. and actually, the business community is is well, well positioned to promote these guys. And of yeah. course, we saw what Yuster was up to. With hindsight, did you catch uh, Tongot before that? No, we, we actually didn't. I know we weren't that close to it. We never understood how it was double accounted for, how how effectively the crops got revalued up, but at the same time there was profitability. We always felt that that was never worth the price. 
uh, for us, there wasn't wasn't necessarily a fraud. We weren't close enough, um, and we never we never caught that. We weren't long. I mean, we just but chose you, to avoid it. You did catch African Bank. Yes, we did catch, and that was basically mostly due to John Pierre Fester, who now, as you know, sits sits on the board of of Capitec. He has a very thorough understanding of of banking, and um, you know, the two of us actually went to several meetings together at the time, African Bank. Um, and as a combination of the work we all did, actually, we realized that, uh, you know, African Bank was, was, was definitely going to become a zero. It was a matter of time and what that catalyst would be. It turned out at the end, the catalyst was more about, um, you know, short-term borrowings that they had made in the form of NCDs, et cetera, that had to roll every month to keep their funding going. And once confidence was lost, you know, that funding gets pulled. That's that's ultimately what caused, I think, the... What, what an the interesting, market. interesting world that you inhabit. It's complex, it's ever-changing, and I'm sure that at the conference you're going to be pulling out a few interesting examples that you can share with us. But getting back to the the, the returns that you've achieved, they've, they've been quite spectacular. On the homepage of the 361 website, it shows that had I invested a million rand in April 2006 in uh, your hedge fund, that today would be worth 11 million rand. Now, the power of compound interest, but you've got to get it right pretty consistently to have the 16% compound annual growth that you've achieved. How do you do that? How do you, do you almost say, well, okay, we're going for 16% this year, let's bank that one and try not to lose if we've already got there? I think for us, it's not, it's not banking. So it, it's about protecting the capital base, especially in the hedge fund, and taking advantage when markets are good and, and advantage of good opportunities and relative opportunities. Mm. So when you're looking at a simple old style portfolio of long only, where you can have a hundred rand that's broken up into 10 or 15 different shares, you really are at the mercy of the market. Yes, you may pick shares that do better than the market, but if the market goes down, you're predominantly going down, maybe to a lesser extent or greater extent. In a hedge fund, you have a whole lot of different tools. Those tools, first of all, allow you to hold a lot less equity because you have no limitation. You're allowed to go short, which I'm sure we'll discuss more at the conference, which is effectively borrowing someone else's shares and using them to sell so that you can make money on the downside. That only that has two objectives. Number one, you'd like to make profit, but number two, that also can hedge another long position that you have, for example, in the same sector. So if the whole sector comes down, as long as the one you picked on the long side comes down less, you still make relative money. So it's a it's a relative game. We then also use a lot of option protection. We work out what our what we call is our physical beta to the market. How this portfolio will behave if markets get knocked and you take the historical beat of every single share and you add it up and it's a scientific calculation but you look at it and you say well if the market goes down 10 this portfolio is going to go down four or five now we look at protecting a four and five so we buy out of the money options to try and protect we've done pretty successfully with that if you look at coming into COVID in the first quarter of 2020 Market was down 25 or 30 percent at one stage. Hedge fund was dead flat. The options protected the net exposure. Same thing this year. You know, we had a good return last year of 20 something mid 20s or upper 20 percent. This year we haven't lost any money because the options have helped us. The net's been lower. The shorts have kicked in. So it's really a, it's a combined lot of tools that you're able to use that you're not able to use mm. in normal long only asset management. You mentioned We've, this year, uh, before we close off, I'd love to get your thoughts on the US market because here we have the worst first half of the year in decades and then a big bounce in July. Yeah, a very big bounce in July. I don't know if that bounce is going to be sustained. There is no doubt in our minds that the US economy is headed for recession. We're seeing mass layoffs. What I think the market is starting to say is that we've peaked at inflation. And because we've peaked at inflation, the Fed's pushed rates too high, too quickly, let's say. 
Um, I think the data will probably start showing as well that, infl that inflation has come down because mm -hmm. you can see the iron ore price is substantially lower year on year. Mm -hmm. The oil price is now slightly below 100 US dollars. Mm -hmm. Most commodity prices, copper, et cetera, have come off substantially. So the market is trying to almost lead the Fed into saying, you know, we're back out of this. Our view and my, my view particularly is it's not over. You know, corporate earnings are going to suffer. We have seen some good earnings um, that are coming off, you know, maybe low bases, and we've seen some good quality tech earnings, which are maybe a little bit different. But we've also seen some big businesses like the WalMarts and the Targets suffer, um, and the consumer, in my mind, will come under pressure in the U.S. Mortgage rates have skyrocketed, unemployment has started to increase, cost of goods has skyrocketed. You know, margins got to be impaired to some extent. So we thinking, you know, that revaluation is not really there. And we didn't benefit much out of the revaluation. I mean, our hedge fund was protected. We never saw that coming. We we're rather sitting, you know, conservatively positioned for the balance of. Are the you long or short? No, we, we, never, we, no, we are, we are neutral. net long. No, we're net mm -hmm. long. You, you, but we long a bit of quality, uh, and we short a bit of stuff that we think is is overpriced. Sai si Jacobs is the co-founder and head of the investment team at 361 and one of our keynote speakers at Biz News Conference in the Berg at the end of August, where he is going to be debating with Pete Fillion. And I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.